friends, it's Morgan and Sherry Snyder, and we are back in the studio, excited to be with you. I'm looking at my bride, and she has a very big smile on her face, as do I. This is part three of a Water Heart podcast series we're bringing to share in some conversation with you as an introduction on this category and big idea around secure attachment. I want to start with a quote from Jim Wilder in his book, Renovated, which we've referred to multiple times. Jim says this, he says, Christianity has tended to focus on right beliefs and right choices as the keys for personal growth. But biblical evidence and modern brain science show that our character is shaped more by whom we love than what we believe. Friends, as we dive into this introduction, I want to linger there for a moment. What if who we become as sons and daughters of God, as kings and queens in God's kingdom, has less to do about right belief and right choices, though that is very important, but much more to do with whom we love? We're wrestling with this big idea that we referred to from Dallas Willard in the first of this three-part series, where Dallas suggests that Christian salvation is actually forming a new attachment with God, that what he said, what he learned in the last year of his life was more important than what he learned in every other year of his life. And it was this very idea of forming a a new attachment with God, of allowing it to transform our character to become like Christ and participating with God in this path and process of being reparented and healed in the core places of our soul that are made to be attached. Mm -hmm. Morgan, I so appreciate that. And as we referenced last episode, it just is mind-blowing to me that Dallas Willard, who has been so formative for Wild at Heart Ministries and for becoming a king, would say this. It just has my attention. And as it relates to attachment, Jim Wilder in his book Renovated quotes a researcher from UCLA who was offering a forum for other neuroscientists and psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors on human formation and human development. And one of the attendees at the forum raised their hand and asked, Dr. Shore, what would you say is the deepest need of the human being? And Shore responded, the deepest need of the human being is to be the sparkle in someone else's eye. He was referring to what we are contemplating here this idea of attachment that someone greater than us would take upon himself or herself the privilege and the role and the commitment of parenting us. And in our earliest years, in our most formative time, communicate through the delight in their gaze. I am so glad to be with you. I am so glad you exist. You are glorious and you make me so happy. To be the sparkle in another's eye, specifically in the eye of one greater than we who is committed to us, is the deepest need of the human being. And friends, as you know, at Wild at Heart, we are very committed to the restoration of genders. And so everything we're talking about is universal, and it's also specific because we each bear the image of God uniquely. And it's also gender centric. And so everything we're exploring, we want to bring through the lens of as a woman or as a man. So as we dive into this, what I wanna remind us of and root us in is something Eugene Peterson said. He said, if something is biblical, then it also will be practical in our everyday life. And so we're taking big ideas, but we want to make them very accessible and very operational. And so then we just speak for a minute as a man, the implications of attachment. I believe very deeply that this nagging experience of lack as a man, our unsatisfied experiences in our bodies, our complex relationships with food, 
our addictions and our commitment to just feel good, no matter what the cost to ourselves or to others. All of our dysfunctional relating in relationships with females, with wives, with daughters, with family members, with coworkers, with any females in our world, and even our unshakable sense of disconnection with God, that all these things are rooted, at least in part, in this central deficiency. And that central deficiency is needing the remedy and has the possibility of recovering secure attachment of our soul to the heart of God. And so what do we mean by attachment? We're walking through this three-part series on attachment. And by way of reminder, I want to take us back to just what is attachment? What are we after and what's possible? Friends, as you know, if you've walked with Wild at Heart and you've explored the larger story, you've walked through Wild at Heart Boot Camp or Basic, Captivating Retreat or Captivating Core, you will be reminded that we are relational at our center, that the centrality of our being in our existence is not autonomy, it's relationship. This relational need and the need to attach appropriately in a healthy manner is present in every human being. It's present in the infant even before higher cognitive processes are activated. Friends, we're designed and destined to attach. This is so important. And so as Sherry alluded to, and as we've talked to in our earlier episodes, our first attachment was meant to be with someone greater than ourselves. And that was meant to come in the form of a loving mother or some feminine caregiver who could consistently over time reflect to us, reflect in touch, reflect in gaze, reflect in sustenance, reflect as a whole person back to us, this idea that Sherry's talking about, glad to be with you. And these, these experiences of attachment are meant to be the foundation where we have a sense of what the scriptures call well-being, robust well-being. There's some settledness. There's some peace. There's some sense of I am worthy of love and belonging because I exist. It is well with my soul. This is the central invitation of the gospel as an infant, as a child, as an adult. And the hope is in our adulthood, we can recover, repair all those pieces of insecure attachment that linger in our story that hound us from seasons past. Morgan, that's so beautiful. And I think for me to be pragmatic, I think of attachment as I experience it in my body. What are my pleasure centers and peace centers connected to? And how can I receive the grace of God to let my pleasure and peace centers, the circuitry of my body, be more and more connected to God through union with Him? manifested not only in my contemplative experience, my direct experience of God, but through attaching in healthy ways to God's people, attaching in healthy ways to nature, attaching in healthy ways to myself and to every faculty of my existence such that I can have um, experiences of peace and pleasure that effectively ignite the power pack of my body to want what is good for me, what is good for others, and what is good for God, instead of having the power pack of my body attached to things that are bringing harm to me or others and being in such strife and civil war. And um, we referred to this in a previous podcast, but when Paul you know, discusses that dilemma of, this, of, of our wrestling with our sin nature, as we crucify our flesh and take the um, bodies that God has given us, with this question of what does it mean to be a Christian in my body, to be Christian in my body, and to have the pleasure and peace centers reattached to God, to nature, and to others in healthy ways. Everything in me will begin to be energized in that direction. And I like to think of it, its attachment is putting the proverbial horse 
before the cart of obedience. If I just am trying to push the cart of my body, you know, away from the things that I know I, I shouldn't be drawn to and toward God, you know, that's like almost futile. But if we can take our attachment center and our faculty of attachment, consider it to be the horse, as it were, enlivened by God, then our obedience is going to have a momentum to it that is going to be such good news and so relieving and so um, much more satisfying than the frustration of why can't I configure my body toward what is good? Why am I so much at war within me and without? I love that image of the horse before the cart and that out of that attachment flows the life in which we are actually trying to seek. Yes. Sherry, you've talked about the stages of development mm -hmm. in the human person mm -hmm. and how attachment expresses itself. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to just walk us through mm -hmm. briefly and as, as a sort of overview of mm -hmm. attachment through the stages. For sure. Morgan, this has just been um, truly life-changing for me. And again, I just credit the work of the counselors and therapists and scientists at the Life Model Works group. You can look them up online. Um, Jim Wilder and a bunch of other people involved in spiritual formation for decades. I really appreciate and have been fortified by their work. So what they explain is that every stage of development, as we move through the stages of, of development, we carry still the needs and what they call the tasks of the stage before it. So we never outgrow our younger stages. We They're included with us, and then we bring them forward in greater maturity. So the stage they don't do much work with is the in utero stage, which we won't talk about, but is a stage of human development that we're not going to touch on today. So the first stage of human development that we'll touch on today is infant, which they describe as being from zero to three. And that stage of our human development is simply about receiving that gaze, glad to be with you, being attached through the committed care of a caregiver and learning how to return to joy and peace. So that joy of glad to be with you and that peace of my body as well, I'm soothed, even when we experience unpleasant emotions. So an infant might, as they get to be a little over a year, they might, for example, do something that is displeasing to the mother. And for a moment, she might flash across her face displeasure and the infant sees that and they might feel some distress. What a child learns is I can return to joy as my caregiver. She returns to glad to be with me. We return to quiet together. And so the infant begins to develop that agility to move from distress back to glad to be with you and quiet together. And their only job is to receive. Next would go the child stage, which you know, depending on what culture we're in, it generally starts around four, three or four, and moves through uh, middle teenage years. And the child stage is about several things. It's about learning how to take care of myself, learning what I think, what I feel, what I need, and how to express that appropriately in relationship, learning what my gifts and talents are. Um, this is so important that I can do hard things that I can do hard things and also learning what satisfies me, what what endeavors in the world as I move beyond just my relationship with my immediate family, what brings me satisfaction? You go from that to the young adult stage and the adult stage. It's very interesting. In the adult stage, we begin to have the task of learning about our false self or our shadow self or um, the liabilities in our character, the maybe the deformations or the places that were immature. And as adults, we're learning to protect ourselves and other people from those liabilities. We're taking accountability and responsibility in relationship. We're also learning to be reciprocal, how to take care of ourselves and others at the same time, to negotiate my needs and the needs of those with whom I'm in reciprocal relationship. We move from the adult stage into the parent stage. And remember that as we move through these stages, we re retain every need and task of the stage before. So we still have the need to receive, to receive glad to be with you, to receive quiet together, to learn how to come back to joy and peace. We still have the needs of the child to know that we can do hard things, to put words to our needs and desires and uh, to take care of ourselves. The adult who's able to be in reciprocal adult relationships 
And then the parent who's able to love, whether they're spiritual children or your biological children, for their own sake, sacrificially, without demanding anything in return. A lot of times, parents will try to create a reciprocal adult relationship with a child, and that gets really tricky. So we have to remember parent is different from reciprocal adult relationships. Finally, we would move into the elder stage, and the elder is able to, he and she has been so formed by God, they have graduated from the parent stage where they're responsible to take care primarily of their own children entrusted to their care, to where they can take care of an entire community sacrificially. And they can be that one greater than the, those young in younger stages of maturity to express unconditional glad to be with you and wise rhythming of quiet together and glad to be with you so that the entire uh, community is brought to higher levels of maturity from the strength and wisdom and sanctification and character formation being formed in the image of Christ. Also, um, an elder is able to interrupt cycles of violence in their community because they've learned from attaching to God to love enemies. And therefore, um, they have a very profound effect on the entire community as they bring people forward. So we just remember that we are every age we've ever been. And for me, Morgan, you know, as I've been learning about the stages of human development, the invitation for, from God is to say, share where let's look kindly at your gaps in your development. Let me reparent you and you and I will partner together to let the love of God, the love of God's people, and an intentional um, life partnering with the unforced rhythms of grace to fill in the gaps. So for me, I I had a gap in my development as a child. I really, I have been slow in learning that I can do hard things. And, you know, there's there can be that whiff of shame of, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, when this came to me, it was really in my 30s. I haven't yet learned that grit that I can do hard things. And so much of the last decade for me of my spiritual formation has been filling in that gap. And that's a task of a child. So even though I was in role of parent and role of adult, Jesus was drawing me to tend to the child within who hadn't yet learned she can do hard things. And it's changed my life to have that gap in my maturity filled in. Again, I've got a long way to go. But as my friend Juanita says, what Jesus has accomplished already is a miracle. So we can begin to be curious about different gaps in our relationship, in our maturity without shame. But I want to finally, Morgan, to just bring it back to attachment. I want to say that in every stage, again, we never outgrow the, the, the needs of the stage before. So we are carrying within us the infant, the, the faculty of attachment that is quicker, faster, um, more sophisticated than our higher cognitive processes. And so I, I have to be a steward of my system of attachment. Now as an adult, I can take responsibility to be reparented by God and to say, I have this capacity to attach. Where am I misattached? And where, by the grace of God, can I form a new attachment to God, a new healthy attachment to other humans, to the grace of nature, and to have a robust system of attachment that becomes the cart of energy, the power pack of my body, moving toward what is good, what is beautiful, and what is true instead of against it. So that's just a quick overview of the stages of maturity, remembering that attachment is always foundational to in each stage. Sherry, it's very hopeful and it's very inspiring. As I'm listening, what, what I'm aware of inside of me is I'm seeing secure attachment and this work of God, this movement of God in us as this narrative arc through our lives in our apprenticeship in the kingdom of God, that all of life is a, is a process and path of maturation. I love when Lewis says that, that heaven is the consummation of our earthly discipleship. And so it's really inspiring to view our discipleship, our apprenticeship with this lens, the interpretive grid of God repairing and restoring our secure attachment to him. As you're describing these stages, child, adult, parent, elder, I'm particularly moved with this idea that as we mature, 
as we become the kind of people that God can entrust the care of his kingdom, we're meant to move into becoming kings and queens. And then we're meant to mature even beyond that to become fathers and mothers, to become elders at the gate, as you said. And it reminds me of this, this word of stewardship, of how we are handling who and what is entrusted to our care. And I love the idea that ultimately our life is for others. And out of this reservoir and out of this spring of life from within us, out of a mature place, a rooted place, a place of well-being, we can do that. We can do hard things and we can steward things really well mm -hmm. at, at great cost, yes. at personal cost. As I think about these stages, I, I'm reminded of some different stories. So I've referred to Becoming Attached by Robert Karen. And he illustrates in a lot of studies that took place in the mid to late 1900s, kind of some of the observations where this plays out. And I just want to reference a few because it's fascinating to observe what this looks like. So they did a study with children that were 18 months old, and they did this fascinating categorization of fundamentally two groups of children. One was very clearly securely attached, and the other was very clearly in an atmosphere of insecure attachment. And so then they observed, what was the effect in an 18-month-old child? And here's what they saw, conclusive and clear evidence that a child who was securely attached at 18 months old knew how to manage desire. They had a capacity to not fall apart under stress. The child that was securely attached at 18 months was more persistent, more enthusiastic, more responsive, and had more imagination. These things were not temperament-based. They weren't personality-driven. They were fundamentally distinctions on secure and insecure attachment. So you have the extreme of a child. And then the other extreme, they did this amazing study of men in their 70s. And what they found, the number one factor in well-being in their life at, in their 70s was the presence or lack of a strong emotional bond with a single consistent feminine caregiver. And so friends, here's the hope is that the work of God repairs that thing that was intended to bring what we're describing as secure attachment. And I want to just highlight, sort of footnote, one other category on this that's really helpful in understanding human relationships. If you've been around kind of the work of relationships, you have probably heard the term narcissism. It's a, a common psychiatric kind of term or diagnosis, but fundamentally it's, it's defined as a person who has an excessive interest or admiration in themselves. It's the kind of person that thinks the world revolves around them. Relationships with a person who manifests the narcissistic personality can be extremely difficult to navigate, whether it's in a marriage or in a work environment, in any sort of community or kingdom, when a person acts like the world revolves around them. But what's fascinating is the research has shown that one of the great factors that actually forms narcissism in an adult stems out of this idea that an infant, as Sherry talked about, has a need to experience being the center of someone's world. They have to experience for a time, for a season, that sense of value, worth, that they are a priority, that there is abundant provision, that when they have a need, someone will act, someone will respond in order that they can mature mm -hmm and explore the fact that they're not the center of the world, right? Because right? we aren't the center of reality. We aren't the center of our story, but a child needs to know you are worthy of love and belonging, that I will change to accommodate your needs. And it's from that foundation a child begins to explore. And sometimes it's just physical. A mom knows this, that as a child has healthy attachment, they'll run off from mom. And if there's danger, a loud sound or something dark, they will run back to mom to their safe place. And so it's from that center that a person learns to live for others. It's out of that reservoir. Now, a person who's an adult who exhibits narcissistic tendencies is a person who never had that. 
fundamentally, you can't live without that connection. And so often in the adult, what you see is the boy or the girl that has a sort of arrested development, that they've not gone through their initiation. And so they're actually a child clamoring for attention, for affection, and gaze. And I want to highlight that because in this story, the heart behind it is to know God, to know ourselves, and to know others in order that we might love. And to understand below the narcissism is actually an ache and a broken, shattered soul that God is interested in repairing. It will give us compassion. It will give us understanding. And friends, fundamentally, we're after love. As we ended the second episode in the series, we talked about God is love and love comes from God, that love fills the gap. So Sherry, like, where does this take you? Mm -hmm. Again, to our listeners, I just want to acknowledge that narcissism is, is super complex. And if you are in relationship with someone who you are curious about, if they are have severe arrested development, um, we just urge you to reach out and find professional help for that and to get some support for yourself in that journey. But Morgan, you know, as we're talking, I'm reminded we we reflected on Paul and um, I believe we reflected on David as well in a previous episode, but I'm brought back to that curiosity of David and what he knew about God in his body, how his body had become attached to God. And it causes me pause and draws me to Psalm 131, which is a Psalm of David. And in it, if you remember, David says, God, my heart is not proud. I do not claim independence from you. I do not claim to be a self-made man. And my eyes are not haughty. I do not look at the world as if it were mine apart from you. And I do not concern myself with great matters. I do not presume that I am more than I am, even as I rest that I am your beloved. But I have calmed and quieted and soothed my soul like a weaned, or I'd like to suggest like an attached child with its mother, like attached child, my soul is content. My soul is not grasping or striving or compulsive or terrified, but like a weaned, like an attached child is my soul within me. So I'm just so encouraged that David was able to form by God's mysterious grace an attachment to the living one that would cause his body to feel so well, so at peace, so content, so satisfied that he could even liken himself to an attached infant. It's just striking to me. Yeah, it's really, that's very profound. Friends, we're nearing the close of this episode. And what I sense coming up in my heart is this question of like, what is the on-ramp? I, I began the podcast with that profound wisdom from Eugene Peterson of if it's biblical, then it must be practical. This has to be operational. Yes. So Sherry, as we're dialoguing on this, I want to give some practical examples and next steps for our friends. I think a story comes to mind as I prayed this morning in preparation for this. I said, like, what, what's a recent experience I had of a practical operational way of, of returning, recovering, repairing secure attachment? So last Friday, I, I was just pretty spent. There's been a lot and it's been heavy. And I had a few hours to sneak away. And so I grabbed my camp chair and I headed to just a little pocket of place where I can hide out in the trees on a piece of public land nearby our home. And I've been reading through the Bible with some friends in the Bible project of a year through, and it's been a real joy. But I can also confess that I've felt behind. It's been a slog because it's a seven days a week kind of process. And there have been a few stints where there were three, four, five days where I just couldn't tend to it. And so I felt behind. So I thought, here's a chance to catch up. So what I was looking for was to relieve mm -hmm. exhaustion and catch up to not feel behind, right? So I head to the woods, camp chair, Bible, and here's the key. 
my phone powered down. No phone. Just nature, God, a Bible, a chair, and time. I sat down, and I was intending to kind of bust through Isaiah, catch up. And I found myself reading for a while, and then I just started falling asleep because I was tired. And I'm in this really comfortable, portable camp chair. And so I slept. And then I woke up and everything was a little brighter, a little more beautiful. I could hear more birds. I could feel more breeze. And then I read Isaiah. And then I fell asleep again. And then I woke up. And then I could smell the pine trees. And I realized I was enveloped. I had entered in to the moment. And now I'm reading through Isaiah. And guys, like, now I'm in Isaiah 66, and I'm present. I'm in my own body. The, the veil is thin. It's become a sacred place. And of all places, as I'm reading through the scriptures, I'm at Isaiah 66, where it says, I've been reading through the message. It says, heaven's my throne and earth my footstool. And I knew that. I'm like, yep, that's true. I'm in it right now. And I read on and God says his promise to his people, to his sons and daughters, I will pour robust well-being into her like a river. The glory of nations like a river in flood. They'll nurse at her breast, nestle in her bosom, be bounced on her knee. As a mother comforts her child, I will comfort you. You will be comforted. You will burst with joy and you will feel 10 feet tall. And so in a few hours time, which felt like a moment, I walked out of the woods and something had shifted, something had transpired. I had ingested the life of God. It didn't take a retreat in the mountains. It didn't take a month long sabbatical. It took time, intention, and a willingness to open my body, open my mind, open my being to reconnect with God not just in my beliefs, not just in my thoughts, but actually in my relating person to person to restore and repair. And so friends, as you wrestle, as you play, as you explore, as you open yourself up to the possibility, I want to give you a homework assignment. Pick a movie. I'll offer two as examples. A film that explores this theme of insecure attachment. One is Gladiator. We often talk about Maximus, but the secondary character that we don't give a lot of visibility to is Commodus. He was the true son, the biological son of Marcus Aurelius and intended to take the throne upon Marcus's death. He was a very insecure man. He lacked attachment. He had a very dysfunctional relationship toward the feminine. He even makes advances sexually towards his sister. And there's this very poignant scene where he's screaming out as loud as a person can scream, am I not merciful? Am I not merciful? And you see in his eyes the longing to become the kind of person that can offer mercy. But what he has is power. And what he's never received is feminine love. He's never received mercy. He's never ingested secure attachment. And so it's a fundamental narrative to observe the story of insecure attachment and its effect when an adult never consents to the path of restoration. Another one you might explore is Antoine Fisher. It's just a stunning story of the path and process of an adult restoring secure attachment through all the stages of development that Sherry laid out, attachment to God through family. And so friends, your second assignment is I invite you, we invite you, would you set aside a bit of time to practice? Set aside some space. Set aside some time to simply receive. Receive love, receive care, receive comfort, and allow the creator of heaven and earth to come towards you, come towards the infant, come towards the child, come towards the teenager, come towards the adult. Receive, receive. 
Morgan, I'm struck by in the story that you shared, the strategy that your body had had to feel well again in the unease of being behind had been to work harder and to get caught up. Mm. Getting caught up equals that will make me feel good. And I just think it is stunning to my heart and it moves me and 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 evokes my desire for God and to receive when the irony was that you were invited to simply receive and then back to quote unquote like then the horse of your body was refreshed so that you could move back into your day um, with a reservoir to, to give love. So it really wasn't work harder. It was receive more. And then in the wake of receiving more, you were able to move back into your your other roles. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. So friends, we are exploring this idea that what if Christian salvation is actually repairing and restoring a genuine attachment to God intended by God for us as our sustenance and our joy since before the creation of the earth. Friends, we are ones who are invited to be saved and to continue to become saved, as Paul says in Philippians. And so let's pray. Father, you are the one who is at work. You are orchestrating a path to save, to restore, to heal, to free, to release prisoners from darkness. And you say in Philippians that you, God, will continually revitalize us. And in that revitalizing, you will implant within us the passion to do the things which are on your heart. And so we stand on the prophecy of Isaiah where he says, come, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you who have no money, come and buy and eat, come and buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I am making an everlasting covenant to you. The same faithful love that I promised David. Come, come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. We receive the waters of life. We receive the cleansing of the water. We receive the revitalizing of the water. We receive the nourishment of the water, the satisfaction of the water, the overflow of the water, the reservoir of the water. You are the river. God, the river flows from your throne and your river intends to saturate everything we are and everything we are not, to saturate who we are and who we are becoming. We ask that you, by your river, would saturate us with a deeper attachment with deeper security in knowing you and in knowing you, knowing ourselves. We choose to come home. We choose to feast. We choose to receive. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, this is just an introduction. We have many resources at Wild at Heart that explore this idea deeper. So you can find us at wildatheart.org. And if you want to dig even deeper uh, in our discipleship track, there are a bunch of resources that dive into this category at becomegoodsoil.com forward slash mother. Thank you for joining Sherry and I. We look forward to being back together with you for another episode of the Wild at Heart podcast. 